as always, we talk about this bishop. We're kind of everywhere. Thanks be to God. Find us, right? Absolutely. How are you? And delighted that this extends through so many uh, means sure. to all the people of our 19 county diocese. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Thrilled How for are that. you? Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Well, and you? No, same. Very good. Good. We're yeah. ramping up, at Ron, as you know, for this uh, ballot, ballot initiative right, and this vote, folks, on November 7th. I cannot emphasize enough how important for us as Catholics it is to exercise our moral responsibility and vote no to what is an extreme measure which would enshrine radical abortion into our state constitution, take away the rights of parents, and remove protections already in place for women and allow abortion up to and including birth at nine months. It is utterly extreme and utterly unacceptable. So please go to my video, go to our website with all of the information, continue to storm heaven with us. Join me for mass at St. Francis Chapel on Monday at 12.05, praying that we might exercise the vote and defeat this ballot. And in the end, I know it sounds corny, but vote no in November. And the, the topic is not corny, it's grave, because it is not political, it is not religious, it's a matter of life. All right, thank you, Bishop. How about your schedule? Thank you, just looking very quickly. So uh, this is going to air, folks, on the Day of All Souls. So a day when we remember all our beloved deceased, and I, of course, remember not only my dear mom and dad and brother, but other, as you do, other members who are deceased from my own family. And I remember especially deceased members of your families and of our diocesan family. All of the bishops, priests, deacons, consecrated religious, and lay faithful who have gone before us, marked with a sign of faith. So on that day, I'll uh, participate in a Board of Trustees meeting for Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Cincinnati, where many of our seminarians attend. Uh, on Saturday, I'll have the joy of confirming a large group of, of young people from Sandusky Catholic Parishes. That's one of our cathedral confirmations. On Sunday, I'll travel to Glandorf to St. John the Baptist to celebrate the Sacrament of Confirmation in the parish. On Monday, we have another Annunciation radio taping. <laughs> and then in the evening, I'll participate in the Christ Child Society and Celebrity Wait Night, which is such a worthy cause in care for children. And let's see, on Wednesday, uh, we go into uh, other work for Annunciation Radio, and that brings us to the 9th, which is where the next show will air. Okay. So that's the calendar well, for now, Ron. Got plenty going on. Absolutely. Always. And of course, uh, needless to say, together with you, I will be exercising my right, right to vote on the 7th of November. Yeah. All right, Thank Bishop. You. Let's go to a recent gospel from Matthew from the 30th Sunday in the Ordinary Time. Thank you. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Your thoughts, Bishop? Thank you, Ron. So I, I always, I, I know I may have used this before, so those of you who have been listening to this show with me for almost nine, well, actually nine years now, because my installation anniversary just passed on October the 22nd, uh, you know that I was, I, I was on a secular uh, daytime radio show, and the fellow, I, I, he's invited me back a number of times, and, uh, and I'm delighted to go back, and I, I won't mention his name, but I can tell you it wouldn't be something you would think I would be on that show, mm. but this is where we go to procra proclaim the gospel. And he asked me, he said, if there was one message you wanted all the people, not just Catholics, all the people in your whole diocese, 8,500 square miles, all of Northwest Ohio to hear, what would that message be? And the first thing that came to my mind by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was taken right from this gospel of Matthew. And I said, well, it would be the words of Jesus. Love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Jesus himself says, these are the greatest commandments. And the reality is, he not only said it, but lived it because he loved his neighbor literally even more than he loved himself dying on the cross for us. So I think it's a great, you know, the whole law and the prophets depend on it. So, you know, the people say who say that, you know, the, once the New Testament began, the Old Testament was passe, not at all. Because if you look at the Old Testament, it's the New Testament is the fulfillment. And so Jesus says the whole law and the prophets depended on these two. And fundamentally, he's saying, and they now have been fulfilled in my person. Imagine, dear folks, if throughout our entire diocese, Catholic or not, we went by the advice, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. My word. <laughs> what a world we'd have. We'd be doing pretty well, wouldn't we? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Bishop. Let's get to... A question. Can we do that? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, let's go to Dan and Sandusky. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we share a first name. Dear, <laughs> dear Bishop Thomas, you recently mentioned that you will be going on your annual retreat. I have never made a monastic retreat before, but would like to do look into doing so. Could you give me some tips on how to get the most out of a retreat? Also, what does a typical retreat look like for you? Thanks, Dan. Terrific, Dan. Well, thank you, uh, and good for you for wanting to do that. I, I think I, I tell you I try to go to a monastic retreat every year. Now, truth be told, and uh, you know, all things revealed, I was not able to make my retreat this year because the week I had slotted out, I had to have a double meniscus tear <laughs> surgery on my left knee. Pardon me. <coughs> and I am, at, as this taping, I am still in PT to recover from that. <laughs> so I'm planning my retreat in a little bit late, obviously, because I couldn't get there and I'm feeling that deeply. So I have gone many, many years, and I know some of the people in our diocese have gone to Gethsemane, to the Trappist Monastery in Gethsemane, Kentucky. There are plenty of other monasteries around, and I would suggest look online. You can find all kinds. And, you know, what's the right fit for you? I'm not sure. I love, for example, to walk while I'm on retreat. So I love a lot of areas to just be outside to pray. And Gethsemane has that for me, as have other places I've been. Now, you say you'd like to look into it. What are tips to get the most out of it? Obviously, I would want you either to speak to your spiritual director if you have one or a priest of uh, some uh, confidentiality who you could say, could you give me some recommendations for this retreat? Now, please know that in a monastery, sometimes there will be talks by monks. Sometimes they'll offer one monk to guide you through the different days of the retreat, which is called a guided retreat, or you're sort of on your own, and you may go to confession at any time to one of the retreat uh, priests or retreat masters. So it all depends on the retreat place and who the religious are and what fit you might like to get the most out of. Now, what does a typical retreat look for you? I in five days, the canonical retreat is you must do five days. Now, most people do five days, which means you arrive after lunch sometime and you leave on Monday and you leave after breakfast on Friday. This poor soul, that's not enough time for me. I am too needy and I need the silence more than just three days and an add-on in the front and the back. So I try to make it longer, first of all, Dan, to try to extend it maybe seven days. And I try to go to a place where there is absolute silence Maybe that's not for everyone, but I find that the depth of my prayer is enriched if there is absolute silence and monasteries are the perfect place where that is observed. In fact, on the table in Gethsemane, there are little signs that say, silence is spoken here, <laughs> which I think is terrific. <laughs> so those are just some, uh, some suggestions, and I, I wish you prayers and blessings for your retreat and would encourage all the folks who listen and watch to make a retreat. Many lay people make a retreat of three days, for example, because it fits their, their work. And whatever it is, even if it's a day, we have places in our diocese where you could retreat and make a day of prayer yourself. And you can easily find all of those online. All right. Good. Thanks, Bishop. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let's 
do a quick one here. Do we have another one? You got about a minute and a half, two minutes. Tom from St. Clement, dear Bishop Thomas, now that the Living Christ Capital Campaign is completed, have the planned upgrades and changes at our Mother Church Rosary Cathedral begun? Can you offer an update or a timetable for some of the goals the campaign addressed? Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom, so much. So first of all, thanks for the great question, and I'm grateful for your generosity and the generosity of so many of our faithful folks who literally made this capital campaign happen. As you know, the original goal was $65 million, and in pledges and gifts, that now is sits at $92 million. If you add the combined parish campaigns, it sits on $105 million, which is extraordinary. Remember, every parish gets 35% of what they collected, which goes directly back to their parish, and Tom, you asked specifically about the cathedral. Have any changes to the cathedral begun? Well, I would refer you actually, and it's you know it's very important for me because I always go to the sources. So remember, this was our Living Christ Capital Campaign brochure. So what did we promise? We promised restoring our mother church, and the promise was that it would be, and I'm just trying to see here, six point two five million dollars would be dedicated to the cathedral for capital and endowment needs. Now, has it begun yet? And Tom, here's the key. Not yet, because we don't have all that money. Remember, mm-hmm. we're talking about gifts and pledges. And Tom, remember that those can be fulfilled between three and five years. So people are being very generous. I encourage the fulfillment of their pledges. But we are working on beginning, and Tom, we said this, restoring our mother church, and here were the bullet points, installation of an air conditioning system, refurbishment of external steps, patios, doors, and tuck pointing, restoration of the sanctuary, restoration of the Skinner organ. That's the order we said, that's the order we're gonna follow, and one of the young men about to be ordained a priest asked me not too long ago, Bishop, will the air conditioning be in for my ordination? (laughs) And I said, well, likely not, and thank you for your understanding. (laughs) But, Tom, that doesn't mean we're not going to do them because we don't have all the money yet, but we've already begun planning for these things. And in addition to that, the endowment for the cathedral. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your generosity. And, folks, you need to know, we're still actually receiving people writing in saying, I'd like to donate to the Living Christ Capital Campaign. What generosity. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Oh, Thank we have you. To take just a quick break, folks. Don't go anywhere. We got a lot of questions to get to. Please right stay back. put, folks. Thank you. So is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo, serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years? Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese, like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. We are back here, folks, at the Bishop's Corner with Bishop Daniel Thomas. So glad you're with us. Thank you. Always eager to get your questions, and you can uh, just submit them at the website or the mobile app. You could also email your question directly to the bishop at AnnunciationRadio.com. Uh, we do ask maybe you give us your first name, your parish, your community, something like that, so the bishop has some idea who he's speaking with. Uh, we do our very best to get them all in, but if you don't hear it the first time you listen to a show, keep listening because you'll probably hear it on one of the future shows. And, Bishop, we're going to go to Sue on social media. Terrific. Thank you, Sue. In these years of the National Eucharistic Revival, can we move the tabernacle to the center of the cathedral? Thanks, Sue. Sue, thank you for asking the question. Not only can we, we will. (laughs) You may or may not know, Sue. I don't know how long you've been listening. I've been saying since I came that that was one of my goals and efforts. People have asked me, why have we not moved the tabernacle yet? Part of that was funding. And I just quoted the capital campaign brochure we did about the restoration of the cathedral. And, Sue, guess what? One of the bullet points says restoration of the sanctuary so that's exactly what we said we would do and the hope is that those funds remember pledges and gifts so not all the money is here yet but that's on that list to restore jesus in the blessed sacrament to his rightful place in the center under the baldacchino because you'll remember that the baptistry obviously that's where the tabernacle extraordinary tabernacle people talk about it all the time 
that's in the baptistry. It was under the baldacchino. We're going to restore it to its proper place. And then the baptismal font will go back to its proper place, which is a sunken eight-sided room for baptisms. So, so can we? Well, we may not be, do I, I can tell you, there was a contractor who said to me, Bishop, he said, I'll bring my equipment in here. He said, we'll lift that up. We'll move that over. We'll take that in. We'll put that in. I said, well, thank you very much, but I hope you understand, Sue. There's a lot that would have to go in artistically and, you know, architecturally to ensure and the plan to have the best possible liturgical setting for all these things. And that's what I want for Our Lady of the Rosary Cathedral. All right. Thank good. you. Thank you. And uh, let's go to Sheila at St. Joan of Arc. Sheila, thank you. Dear Bishop Thomas, I was struck when I visited the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in uh, Hanksville, Alabama, started by EWTN founder's mother, Angelica. There was a crucifix that displayed Jesus all bloody and with numerous scars and lacerations. I don't see many crucifixes that seem as close to this lifelike image of what Jesus' body would have looked like during his passion. Is there any reason that more churches don't display Jesus' body in this way to show the cruelty of his execution? Thank you, Sheila. So thank you, Sheila. And I think it's a simple answer, artistic choice and taste. So literally beyond that answer, I don't have an answer for you, Sheila. It's simply a matter of usually, you know, parishes have art committees or liturgy committees where they choose what the parish, you know, will look like. I was just in one of our oldest churches in the diocese and you know there's a massive crucifix in, on one of the front pillars and many of our older churches have those they may not depict Jesus in the most bloodied fashion as the crucifix which you saw but they nevertheless depict Jesus crucified and remember that the liturgical norms say that a crucifix in the sanctuary you know front and center visible that's really basically the norm of the church. So I think in the end, what you're talking about is simply a matter of liturgical taste and artistic interpretation. Okay, good. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, we'll Can we get another one? Yeah, yeah, a couple. Oh more, my I goodness, think. Madeline online, dear Bishop. Thank uh, you, Madeline. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, and I wanted to know the origins of this term for Jesus to identify himself in this way. How did the culture in Jesus's day take this reference? Um, Thanks, Madeline. And I, and I would comment, too, that that has been something that I think about sometimes and other people have asked me. It's such a kind of unusual way of identifying himself. Right. So I think it's important. Obviously, we could do a scripture course on yes. this, <laughs> and, and it could be a full scripture course that lasts for a whole semester in a seminary, right? Well, we or don't have that much. Time. Exactly. So I guess first I would say that it, the term is used in various ways in Scripture, first in the Old Testament. For example, son of man is a metaphor or an idiom to refer to a human being or a mere mortal. And that's Numbers, Job, Psalm, Sirach. It's also used to refer to prophets such as Ezekiel and Daniel. Jesus uses the term to describe himself in the New Testament, Madeline, as you indicate. And in some ways, he uses it to show his solidarity with humanity. But it's a term for the prophesied Messiah. You can go to the book of Daniel mm -hmm. and the one who looks for the divine Messiah in glory. Jesus conveys that he is the fulfillment of this verse, the son of man. So it's actually he is the son of man, clearly identifying with the prophetic figure. And you can find this in the Gospel of Matthew. He u uses it also to illustrate he has divine prerogatives, including the authority to forgive sins, mark, suspend the Sabbath. Mark, you know, the son of man, et cetera, et cetera, to judge men and even provide eternal life through consuming his flesh. Whoever eats and drinks the flesh of the son of man will live forever. So when it's the son of man, it's the prediction of the divine Messiah who is Jesus Christ. So it's the, 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 the son the. of man. <laughs> the right. The With the emphasis on yeah. the. Okay. Exactly. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. One Can more. Can we do one more? Yeah. Allison in social media. Dear Bishop Thomas, I had a difficult year from some larger tragedies to many smaller incidents. It's crossed my mind that I could have a spiritual issue like a curse. Is that something I should even worry about? And if so, what should I do? Thanks, Allison. Thank you, Allison. So I, I, I just want to 
pop back to a phrase that is so popular in my mind. You know, recently we celebrated in September the Feast of St. Padre Pio. And, you know, one of his most popular phrases that he would tell people in confession, in spiritual direction, anybody who thought they were being racked by the devil, his response, pray, hope, and don't worry. So I think it's a beautiful thing. Please, I'm not, it's not a cop-out response to you. And I'm sorry that you've had some tragedies and other incidents in your life which have caused it to be such a difficult year. My first recommendation is pray with all your heart, mind, and soul. Hope that the Lord knows what he's doing and will give you the grace to live whatever is being put before you. And don't worry. Now, Allison, if there are supernatural indications of things going on which cannot be explained otherwise if people are saying to you that you are not yourself and this is a very difficult situation what is happening I would humbly suggest you'd want to go and sit down with a priest and talk to that priest if there are practical objective identifiable manifestations which might imply that there was some sort of curse that was placed on you at some point in your life but i think unless those are evident pray hope and don't worry yeah we have about a minute or so thank so you i have time for another one but as a priest and 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 listen and a bishop li- listening to confessions and counseling over the years sure you, you probably do run into a, a lot of people that deal with stuff like this or, or at least have those concerns, right? That so I would say, Ron, not a not lot. Of, really. Not okay. a lot of people. All right. I would say persons being concerned. I would say this concern has increased more okay. since a fascination with the evil mm-hmm. one has become more and more popular. Okay. So I think we have to be very concerned and careful, you know. And obviously, if if, if someone goes and, and talks to a priest, it might be that a first recommendation would be. You know, why don't you why don't you po- possibly just go and visit with a good Catholic psychologist mm-hmm. who might be able to help you through your troubles at right. this time? Because you know, a- every priest is not a doctor specialist in things psychological or psychiatric, sure. and that's why I talk about objective, verifiable, you know, factual manifestations yeah. of something. Yeah, because oftentimes it's our own worries and concerns which might sort of seem to. Sure to sure. e- even I don't want to say the, the word create them but you know put us in a yeah. state where yeah. we become so worried that we're not sure of what's even real right. so I think those things are, are very practical first yeah. we have to ask ourselves those and then yeah. if there are those things then I think we take a next step to and talk to a person. and sometimes bad things just happen to us right well, <laughs> well, exactly. It's not yeah. necessarily no, that's right. like included, and we don't want to trivialize in any exactly. in any exactly. in any way this yeah. reality. Yeah. And I have known cases where someone has had a curse placed upon them with someone who dabbled in the demonic. Mm. So I- I- it's a possibility, mm-hmm. but there are often manifestations of that, yeah. and they're verifiable manifestations yeah. Yeah, that's great okay yeah. well thank you bishop and thank we you. are out of time now could we get a prayer and blessing my goodness let's pray and folks let's pray especially that the ballot initiative on november 7th will be defeated that people of good faith and catholic conscience will vote no on november 7th and that we might protect the rights of parents the good protection of women and life in the womb of the unborn Father in heaven, grant us all this grace and that we might faithfully carry out your will and vote and act in the defense of human life, born and preborn. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, folks, for being with us and many blessings for the days ahead. We'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's Club. Thank you.